I survived 30 days as a woman in Bannerlord, and this is what happened. Okay, now that I clickbaited you here, I'm going to be honest. The challenge isn't playing as a lady, because we all know men and women are 100% equal all the time. The real test is making a name for yourself when you have absolutely nothing. No money, no morale, no food, no health, no weapon, and no one to help you. I call this the rock bottom challenge and it's become a bit of a tradition on the channel but it has been more than a couple of years since last time I've tried it so let's see how it goes. Because I don't want to bore you to death by explaining the rules, rules. of this challenge, I'll just quickly put them on the screen. Now that you're all caught up, let's begin. Meet Astrid. Her father was a traveling merchant from Batania who wasn't very wealthy. Due to his cautious nature, he preferred to trade locally instead of taking the risk of transporting his wares to faraway places. Even so, he's done his best to provide for his family and they never struggled. Until his wife and Astrid's mother has fallen ill and most of the money had to go to the doctors who attempted to heal her. For a couple of years they've managed to keep her alive, but in the end, it was all in vain. But life must go on and after Astrid turned 19, she asked her father to sell the little home they had in Marunath, reinvest that money into a new caravan and take her with him on his journeys. Life on the road can be harsh, however, so this time they would take some risks in order to make money faster and afford a new home someplace else. Upon hearing rumors that the town of Kuyaz was under siege, their caravan bought all the food they could carry and set course over there, planning to pitch camp outside the city walls, wait for the siege to come to an end and then sell their goods at a premium price. A good plan! Unfortunately, a large coalition of bandits had a plan of their own, which involved ambushing trade convoys on the bridge between the continent and the desert, and their plan worked out much better than ours. All the combatants were put to the sword and everyone else was captured, including Astrid and her father. For about a year, they've been kept as thralls by the largest gang of desert bandits, forced to mine silver in the cave they used as a base of operations. But on one fateful night, Astrid's father overheard the outlaws talk about sending more people on raids, which means fewer guards here. So he seized the opportunity and decided to mine a different type of grey matter. That night he fought like a monster, carving a path through the bandits towards freedom. But the commotion drew the attention of the ringleader and his lieutenants who intercepted the SKPs as they were about to flee. The duo faced a simple choice. They could both fight shoulder to shoulder and most likely lose, or Astrid could run away while her father kept the outlaws at bay. He chose the second option and managed to take down one more bandit before he paid the ultimate price. But his heroism bought his daughter her freedom and with teary eyes, she made her way to the nearest village to look for help but to her dismay, the residents called the guards before she even had the chance to speak. She spent such a long time among brigands that the law-abiding citizens of this land now considered her to be one of them and thought she's drawing them into a trap. She ran as fast as she could but soon enough she found herself being chased by the noble who ruled over that village as well as his entire retinue. Unable to fight an entire army or outrun them for very long, she had to choose the lesser evil and let herself be captured by the nearest band of looters. No idea what the nobility has in store for her now that she's an outlaw. Bandits, at the very least, would keep her alive. Not long after, she managed to make her escape once more, this time with the knowledge that the lawful world has forsaken her and she is on her own. And this is where Astrid's story begins. Let's see what the next 30 days have in store for her. Will she remain a slave to the bandits who roam these lands? Get caught by the local law enforcement? Or will she claw her way out of this? First, let's make an assessment of what we have. Um, nothing. Not even some rags to cover ourselves with. All we've got is the will to survive and thrive in a world that hates us, precious. In order for Astrid to get out of this, however, she needs the strength to put up a fight, which is difficult when you have no food in your belly. 
but there are solutions to everything. She could, theoretically, beat some outlaws and take their supplies, or she could go to a freshly raided settlement with no defenders and steal their butter, or travel to the bandit hideout she spotted earlier and sneak around gorging on whatever crumbs she can find. On her way there, however, she got caught by a group of seven bandits who uh, wanted to talk about the weather. A hot day, is it not? The conversation was rather dull and bored Astrid out of her mind, but at least the fellas were nice enough to keep her fed, if only barely. After a couple of days, Astrid saw an opportunity to escape the conversation and then resumed her journey towards the nearby hideout, where the only thing she could do was wait and try to keep herself in a stable condition. During the day, when the brigands were busy with their routines, she could sneak around their camp and snack on whatever leftovers she found at their tables, but at night, she had to be cautious. But not like her father. Maybe if he took some risks, he could have afforded better doctors and her mother would still be alive. With this lingering thought, on the second night of waiting, she went to scout the hideout and see if the residents are easy prey. Turns out they're not. Worse yet, if she were to be cut down by the Ryatagans, that would be the end of her story, so she's done the smart thing and disappeared into the night. The next evening, however, because she was feeling 100% ready for a fight, Lady Hagal decided to visit the residents of this hideout yet again. Against untrained Bedouins, she's got a tiny chance of success. Not against two of them at a time though, at least not now, so she sought out a rover that's all alone and when he found her, she attempted to punch and kick him while at the same time narrowly dodging the swings of his mace. Unburdened by earthly possessions, she could slightly outrun the villain, which gave her a negligible advantage in this fight. But she hits like a girl, so she needed to give the guy at least 30 bruises before he went down. And if she got bludgeoned a couple of times, it would be over for her. And that did happen eventually, but through sheer force of will, she was still standing and after two minutes of intense fighting, she's defeated her first foe and took his mace. Armed and dangerous, Astrid went to fight the other two who were chilling by the campfire. She attempted to take them by surprise, but that didn't work. Still, the first one fell pretty easily and the second was defeated with a combination of kicks to the ribcage and bonks to the head. The speed of being unburdened means a lot more when you also have a weapon. Against the fourth Bedouin, she's decided to employ the same hit-and-run tactic that helped her prevail against the first three, but her luck ran out when she got a bit too close for comfort. Fortunately, the blunt weapon only incapacitated her and she's still alive. Before the scum did anything else to her, our hero regained consciousness and managed to flee, though she's back to square one. With nothing better to do, Astrid resumed her routine of hanging around the hideout and feeding on scraps for a couple more days. She would have liked to do that for longer, but a wandering gang snatched her in the middle of the night and dragged her around for some time. Many days later, she broke free once more, but instead of returning to her usual place, she's decided to venture forth to another hideout she knew about from her recent past. New place, new opportunities. Before reaching her destination, another band of sand people intercepted Astrid and took her along to show her the local attractions. Uh, sand, sand and uh, more sand. I hate sand. It's coarse, it's rough and irritating, and it gets everywhere. As she was being given the local tour, she noticed a lone Bedouin roaming the desert, dragging two prisoners with him. If she could have a chat with him, maybe she could get some food and even make a new friend. Eventually, she caught up and the man was instantly struck by this divinely beautiful girl who wanted to befriend him. A hot day, is it not? How could he say no? Now he had three friends with him, but like any man, he tried to escape the friend zone, which drove Astrid away. Rookie mistake, you don't escape the friend zone. But when she realized she still needed food, as well as other things, 
She ran back after the guy and challenged him to fisticuffs. She's already proven she has a mean right hook. This fight wasn't too different from the first bare-knuckle brawl you've witnessed, except this time the Bedouin doesn't have anyone around to help him. 1v1, a fair fight. I mean, sure, he's armed and she's not, but his mallet isn't long enough to sweep a lady off her feet. With a bit of caution and a lot of patience, she can dodge his swings, kick him in the nuts and punch his teeth out. Confident after her foray into that hideout, Astrid was a lot more aggressive this time around, using new combat techniques. Uppercuts in the ribs and the liver and the spleen, baiting and counter-attacking, as well as relying on already proven techniques, such as proper spacing with the kicks or punches in the mouth. Because she was using a hit-and-run fighting style, her opponent called her... But that doesn't make any sense? An armed man fighting a naked and unarmed woman? Who's the real coward? There were a few close calls here and there, but after about three minutes of running, kicking and slapping, Astrid emerged victorious at last. Her first priority was to free the Aserai peasants that the bandit planned to sell into slavery and ask them for their names. Hassan and Yusuf. Nice to meet you, boys. She then captured the outlaw, telling him, I won you, fair and square. Seeing this as an opportunity to escape the friend zone, the lad nodded in agreement, but when Astrid returned for the loot, most of it was gone, buried under the sand that was blown around by the desert winds. Ugh, I hate sand. All she managed to recover was 25 dinars, a robe and a sack of grain. At least she's clothed and won't be starving anytime soon, but she has four mouths to feed, so that grain will only last us for a week at most. But that was the first of many steps our heroine needed to take in order to make her way in a man's world. The next step was traveling to the horse ranch of Malul, in hopes that the peasants she rescued would explain to the locals that she's not a criminal. But before talking to the militia, the duo confessed to her that they, uh, actually stole some stallions from here and sold them to the desert bandits. In spite of that, they still got kidnapped, so I guess that honor among thieves is only a myth. As long as we didn't get too close to anyone, the authorities would leave us alone and most outlaws wouldn't dare come this close to a settlement. Uh, never mind. These seven actually had the guts to start a fight right here in the village. The residents weren't in any danger, as this wasn't a direct attack on them. So everybody went inside their homes and waited for all this to blow over. Not even the militia intervened, I mean, why would they? As far as they were concerned, this gang dispute was beneath their pay grade. Seven trained killers versus two civilians led by an unarmed and inexperienced girl. Who would win? Let's analyze the battlefield. Their side has four horsemen, one of whom is equipped with javelins, and three footmen armed with maces and spears. Our side has two peasants with farming tools, and a lady who's armed with two good old-fashioned fists, as well as a brain that could prove to be the deadliest weapon yet. Since the cavalry is the greatest threat, let's render them useless by using geometry to our advantage, making it impossible for them to get to us. They could dismount, of course, but once a Bedouin obtains a horse, he considers it a great shame to climb out of the saddle. Once we were on the rooftop of one of the houses here, all we needed to do was dodge the missiles and wait for the footmen to climb to us. It's over, Anakin! I have the high ground! Before the walkers arrived, Astrid picked up the javelins that landed on the roof and prepared to use them in the upcoming melee, so as not to be entirely useless. In the meantime, she kept baiting the Harami to keep sending her ammo, but before long, the sound of fighting snapped her out of that little dance. 
Without hesitation, she drove her spear into the face of a rover, killing him instantly and stabbed another in the back three times before he succumbed to his wounds. Her two friends took care of the third one, but we were still being hunted by four mountain bandits. And we couldn't stay on this rooftop forever. We needed to confront them, even though they were extremely dangerous. The most important thing was waiting for the Harami to run out of javelins and pick them up, if possible. Well, that one requires a ladder. After formulating a plan, we decided to stay right on top of the stairs and wait for our enemies to get stuck in the local architecture, so that we can more easily pepper them with stones and thrown spears. That's how the first nomad fell, and Astrid did not hesitate to pick up his lance, after which she attempted to shoot another one off his horse, but she missed and needed to run to the javelin and pick it back up, which made her vulnerable. Don't worry, she made it back to the stairs and after being stuck in a stalemate for a few minutes, two of the raiders' horses got stuck in a fence, which made them easy targets. So she returned the javelins to their rightful owner and stabbed the nomad with his brother's spear. But there's still one other rider roaming around and if our fair maiden gets punctured, that's the end for her. In order to stack the odds in her favor, she picked up the Harami's shield and then mentally prepared to confront her final foe. In the last few seconds of this fight, she ordered her dear friends to form a human wall in front of her, while she grabbed her spear with confidence as the enemy stampeded towards her. Hey, you! Finally awake. Wait, we won? We actually did. I thought Astrid died there, but it seems the nomad wasted his stab on Yusuf and didn't have time to ready another attack. She only got slightly trampled by the horse, while the raider impaled himself on her braced spear. Nice! Unfortunately for the outlaws, there were no survivors we could turn to our side and unfortunately for us, the villagers didn't allow us to take any weapons, horses or food from the bandits we've defeated. On that condition, they allowed us to walk away. All we managed to get was about 150 gold, a padded armor, shoes, a turban and a shield among some garbage that we'd sell for another 65 dinars right here in the village. It is disappointing for Astrid to still be unarmed, dismounted and on the verge of starvation after such a great victory, but at least it inspired confidence in her new friends. The bruised Bedouin also joined our little group after such a display of cunning. Said his name's Karim and he's never witnessed such savagery in his entire career, and from a woman no less. Looks like Astrid's earned her number one fan. After this we attempted to pick some easier fights, since our food situation was getting desperate and just as we were about to run out, we encountered a group of six brigands with the same troop composition as before. Our tactics needed to be different, however, since we were in the open desert and didn't have any geometry to rely on. In the first few seconds of this fight, I gave my boys the order to go after the enemy cavalry, picked up a javelin and watched the Bedouin rover trip on his shoelaces. The fact I'm missing a javelin has nothing to do with it. I then spent some time being chased by the other two until I called the lads to me, which gave me some breathing room and allowed me to make another bandit trip and fall, after which all we needed to do was deal with the horsemen. So I ran around, collected a mace and three more javelins, and used one of them to set this sinner free. After picking up his spear, I was able to stop a rider dead in his tracks and heavily injured him, but he managed to ride away and prepare for another charge. What is a nomad's greatest strength? His mount. After all, horses are faster than men, but at the same time, horses are dumber than men. Unfortunately for Yusuf, as we focused on killing one of the riders, the other one murdered our dear friend. A life for a life. As the nomad charged towards us for the final time, I downed his horse with a javelin to the head and then smacked him with my mace. To pay for his crime against Yusuf, he would take his place in our crew, eventually. 
as a reward for winning the fight. I got 130 gold, my first weapon, a master crafted mace, a bunch of random loot that will be sold in a village and some cheese that would keep us fed for the next 6 days. I sure hope we'll find more sustenance before our cheese runs out. As we were roaming the desert looking for nutrients, we ran into a group of three Bedouin rovers who recklessly attacked us even though we were a bit stronger. A hot day, is it not? This brawl was rather straightforward. Because our enemies were armed with blunt weapons, none of us risked our lives, so I told my two buddies to fight without fear and within 30 seconds, we were victorious. But when I asked the survivors why they didn't just run away, even though they could have, they said they were starving and hoped that we had some snacks they could borrow. Feeling merciful, Astrid took the thieves under her wing as prisoners and continued hunting for a gang that had enough food for everyone in her crew. Eventually our search brought us back to the village of Malul where we sold our stolen equipment and attempted to just buy some provisions, but the village elder told us that he must take everything into the city and doesn't have any to spare for us. I know he's lying and I would take it by force, but the three of us can't deal with the local militia, so we resigned to just roam the desert until we find someone we can steal from. After dodging some gangs we couldn't fight, we eventually encountered a small crew comprised of a rider and four footmen. Hello, traveler. Hope you brought your purse. The infantry was pretty easy to deal with. I hit them from behind while they were busy fighting my three lads. They must have not thought me capable of inflicting damage and were probably expecting to get a relaxing massage instead. Well, they're sleeping now, so maybe they were right. But the horseman killed one of the rovers that recently joined up and proceeded to ride around, taking jabs at us. Because he wasn't very good at using the spear, Hassan perished as well and while Astrid grieved for him, she had to pick up his weapon and put it to good use. And so she did and when the nomad was dismounted, she bludgeoned him into a coma. And while she mourned the loss of her dear friend, Astrid realized that the world is a cruel place and if she wanted to survive, she needed trained killers in her crew. So she captured the nomad, planning to turn him to her side, but left his four friends behind, because she couldn't afford to keep them fed. As for the loot, we found a cracked spear and a bit of meat that would keep us alive for a few more days. In order to stretch our already limited supplies, we had to abandon two of the Bedouin rovers we captured earlier. This gained us three extra days until we ran out of food and at this point, there were only four of us. Our girl, her number one fan and a couple of captive nomads. After Karim told them how Astrid beat someone with her bare hands, neglecting to mention the small detail that the someone was himself, as well as describing her other exploits in great detail, Yusuf's killer decided to join our crew, said his name was John. Not from around here, I guess, but then again, not all desert bandits are locals, I mean, look at Astrid. To our surprise, John possessed the ability to call a horse to him with a special whistling technique, which he refused to share with us. Trade secret, he said. Mm-hmm. All right then. As soon as he did that, our traveling speed increased significantly because he had Astrid climb on the horse with him, which forced the other two to start running behind us. With this speed advantage, we were now able to outrun almost anyone and pick our fights. The lady would have preferred to find her own mount, but this is acceptable too. After about a day of roaming around, we found our next victims. A couple of Bedouin rovers. Thanks to our newfound speed, we were able to drive them away from the larger gangs that protected them, isolate them and then put them to the sword. In the interest of maintaining our traveling speed, we refused to take the peasant we've rescued into our gang and to our pleasant surprise, we managed to obtain some butter. Delicious, finally some damn good food. 
and while we had enough provisions to last us for 16 days, when Astrid noticed a group of travelers with seven footmen and a single rider, she knew their easy prey. Before they reached us, she ordered John to dismount, borrowed his horse and gave her friends the order to retreat because she knew how to handle all the enemies on her own. Her first priority was to incapacitate the Nomad because we need horsemen in our gang, but due to the risky nature of this job, she got cut a little. Luckily, the padded armor saved her life and she managed to knock the Nomad off his horse. As for the footmen, they stupidly clumped together and attempted to stab her with their spears, but they mostly got in each other's way, which allowed Astrid to easily ride around them and stab them in the head from the comfort of her saddle. She still needed to be careful though, because one wrong move is all it takes for her to bite the dust, but after two minutes, all but one Bedouin became food for the vultures. She gave the last man the chance to duel her, but he was weak, not fit to join her crew. Up to this point, John only heard stories of his leader's abilities, but now that he's seen it with his own two eyes, he's starting to believe in her. The loot was nearly worthless, but at least we kidnapped another rider to add to the family. On day 25, that lad decided to join our crew after hearing Karim and John talk about the great deeds of their future queen. And now we were much faster, since we had four people riding on two horses. A couple of days later, the final prisoner joined up as well, and now there were five of us, ready to establish ourselves as the fiercest gang in the desert. And since we were a lot stronger, we decided to challenge a slightly larger tribe to a little wager. A fight to the death, winner takes all. My tactic was to dismount my horsemen because they're a lot deadlier on foot, especially against enemy riders. Unfortunately, the newest member of our gang failed to use his spear correctly and paid with his life. As for myself, I mounted up and went after the enemy cavalry since they're our most dangerous foes. Little did I know that I was already left all alone, because I overestimated the capabilities of my own men. Well, this wouldn't be the first time Astrid handles a gang all on her own. Thanks to her dexterity, she managed to hit one of the nomads in the shoulder, giving him a nasty wound, and stabbing the other one in the heart. As for the walkers, you already know how easy they are to deal with, especially because of Astrid's foresight to pick up the spear dropped by her fallen companion, which is a lot better than the one she had equipped. Unfortunately, in addition to our newest recruit, Astrid lost her number one fan as well. Rest in peace, Karim. Thankfully, John and one other were still breathing and they have their lady to thank for it. This is the second time she's killed a gang all on her own. First time could have been luck, but now, John's faith in his fierce leader was unquestioning. The sacrifice of her men earned Astrid a masterwork spear and a bit of extra butter, and she also saved six peasants from imprisonment who have all chosen to pay their life debt in her service. Out of curiosity, we put these lads to the test against a gang of 11 bandits and they handled themselves wonderfully. We didn't lose a single one. The loot was also quite nice, 250 gold and some date fruits in addition to some stuff we could sell. Not that money matters too much, we can't buy anything from anyone, but my men demand their daily wages and if we run out of cash, the gang dissolves. But we couldn't keep scraping the bottom of the barrel. We wanted bigger scores and for that, we needed a stronger crew. When we saw another posse of 11 outlaws wandering around, we challenged them to a fight. The only thing I've done differently this time around was try my best to capture their leader instead of killing him. The Harami is one of the greatest soldiers the desert has to offer and after some heavy fighting, I managed to kill his horse and knock him on his ass as he attempted to chase my allies. The plunder was pretty damn good as well as it contained enough foodstuffs to allow us to enjoy a more varied diet. But this victory gave us a mild case of suffering from success because we now had so much stuff we had trouble carrying it around. The speed penalty wasn't too severe, but we needed to unburden ourselves before getting caught by someone we couldn't fight. 
After we liquidated our assets, we spent four more days exploring the desert while waiting for the Harami to join us, but at some point, two marauding tribes ganged up on us. A hot day, is it not? The fight lasted for almost eight minutes and we lost one of our nomads, but the rest of the men were ordered to GTFO while Astrid dealt with this mess on her own. You've already seen her annihilate entire groups from horseback, so this wasn't too different, except for the fact that she's done her best to save their leader for last. As the broken bodies of her enemies lied scattered on the battlefield, our heroine descended from the saddle, readied her mace and challenged the sinner to single combat. The opponents exchanged blows until their shields shattered and the duel continued long after, with none being able to gain the upper hand as they masterfully parried each other's strikes. Until Astrid decided to abandon defense altogether and landed a hit on her opponent as he was in the middle of his swing. Turns out her mace is a lot faster, and once she capitalized on her only advantage, the Harami was humbled. Another fine addition to our clan, once his wounds, and most importantly, his pride, have healed up. And while John's faith was already unquestioning, this display of might only served to strengthen his devotion and spread it among the troops like wildfire. As the men were recalled to help loot the battlefield, they were surprised to find a couple of tame horses grazing on the blood-stained grass. Must have belonged to the two nomads Astrid killed. Finally! No more walking! But now we had a lot of loot for sale, and after we visited a couple of nearby villages, we reached almost 4,000 dinars. But we also had something we didn't want. Attention from an Aserai lord who developed a crush on Astrid, thinking she can outrun him through. Here, she chased a small group of looters and killed them all. Unfortunately, the path she imagined was impossible because the terrain was impassable and the only way out of here was blocked by Hakan who confronted our gang and sentenced us to death. I would know whom I slay. 10 versus 115. I wonder who would win. Dune Raiders, to glory! Astrid shouted and most likely charged alongside her men to certain death. The only thing that could possibly save her is the undying faith of her devotees. Are you one of them? Do you have faith that she made it out alive? Would you like to see how her story turned out if she were to survive this? If so, the best display of faith is pointing your thumb upwards, so that the Divine grants Astrid his blessings and help her find a way out of this mess. On a more serious note, this was initially intended to be a 100 day challenge, but the original video would have been over one hour long and boy, that's a lot of editing. I had to make things a bit more manageable, which is why this is the perfect time in Astrid's story to take a break. When part 2 is done, it'll be uploaded here on the channel and I'll also merge both parts into a single video, which will be uploaded on the second channel, so you should probably go over there and subscribe as well. I got a lot of extra content planned for that one, so I'd really appreciate it if you lads helped it reach a thousand subs. If you do, best to disable the bell, though. Most videos on that channel won't be on the same level as on the main channel and I don't want you to get spammed with notifications. Anyway, since this is my first video for 2024, I wanted to wish you all a happy new year and I hope to see you next time. Goodbye.